it will probably come as zero surprise to you by now that I am a huge fan of Star Trek and one of the reasons I'm such a fan of the franchise of all the lovable characters fantastic technology and machinery and all else it's it's because of the way star trek tells stories star trek encourages you to immerse yourself in its universe to delve in and plumb the depths with it in a way that no other sci-fi really does i mean i would say the Reimagination of Battlestar Galactica probably does it, but if we was to compare it, should we say to Star Wars? Is it a completely different way of storytelling? Star Wars, you follow this archetypal hero's journey narrative throughout all nine nine of the main run films. Star Trek's different. Star Trek encourages you to, in the early phases of it, enjoy it in an episodic format, but very importantly for this video. It encourages you to enjoy it in an episodic format and also be able to follow a multi series story arc. And the reason we can do this at this stage in Star Trek is because of the groundwork that was laid during the mid to late era of Star Trek The Next Generation and of the universe building, the world building that took place in Deep Space Nine. And today's video, I'm going to talk about the world or the universe that Deep Space Nine inhabits. And I'm going to attempt to answer that question. Why Deep Space Nine? Why did this, why, why was it set here? What went on in the fictional background for it to happen? Let's have a look. Deep Space Nine takes place roughly three years after the events of the Star Trek Next Generation episode, The Best of Both Worlds. And that's important, actually, for the argument I'm going to be making throughout this video. So, in universe, for Deep Space Nine, the villains, the main villains throughout the show are the Cardassian people. And they're really well done, they're really well fleshed out, they're really, really well characterised. Their, their culture is, is, is seen regularly, it's shown to be deep, and it's shown to, to have much nuance to it. And it's a very well-rounded and well-written element to the story. But what's important to how I'm going to do this video is that I'm going to look at it from an in-universe in point of view. So, starting out from the very beginning here, Cardassia, at this stage, is weak. The Cardassian people are not a power. They're not a great power within the... Milky Way Galaxy. Those great powers, the three great powers of the Milky Way Galaxy are the United Federation of Planets, the Klingon Empire and the Romulan Star Empire, with other local powers such as the Breen Confederacy, the Gorn Hegemony, other powers like that exist and Cardassia is just one of those also ran type powers but I think everything in 
the relations between the Cardassian Union, which at this point, at the Battle of All 359 and the Next Generation Era, are, are peaceful. I think the Battle of All 359 changed everything for relations between the Cardassians and the Federation. And this may seem a bit counterintuitive because War 359, the, the ball was entering from Beta Quadrant, coming coming from the Delta Quadrant. They had nothing to do with, uh, they weren't coming from that direction. If you look at the map, they're coming from the east and Cardassia and the Cardassian Union is on the west. So why? why do, where does that connection happen? Well, so we have a local power which is a highly militarized society with a strong martial code uh, it's a dictatorship it's, it's all of the things the federation doesn't do it's it, it's um it's a xenophobic society it's a society where you are well, you're, you're found guilty. It's not even a matter of being in, like you know, guilty until proven innocent. It's a matter of like you know you're guilty, and we're going to show you why you're guilty. Lots of things like this are just sort of very anti-federation. But if you look here at the map, we can see the Milky Way galaxy as it is in the Star Trek universe, and you see that. If the other two great powers of the Milky Way galaxy, or at least the Alpha and Beta quadrants, are on the eastern and northern flank of the Federation, Cardassia isn't. Cardassia is on the far western flank of the Federation. It's a middling type civilization on the edge of the Federation and the Federation as and Starfleet in particular has historically always concentrated its resources on where the main foes were going to be which was traditionally the Klingons and the Romulans and later on we start getting the Borg and other races coming in through, through the Beta Quadrant so there's a, a war occurs along the border and with a certain degree of arrogance I would say Starfleet doesn't take this war as seriously as the Cardassians do for the Cardassians it's this life or death struggle and they are fighting this, this invasive species or multiple species whereas the Federation aren't the Federation are going in there with sort of rear echelon units, they're going in there with with starships that are antiquated which but are still more than a match for the Cardassians. And we can see that that the Federation overmatched the Card like the, the Cardassians just from this this policy alone. And we later on see a Nebula class starship which hasn't even got a weapons pod really you know, it's got a it's got a sensor pod cause it causing absolute mayhem along the border so during this period of conflict with the Cardassian Union the Federation again they're not really taking it seriously to them it's a it's a it's a small border conflict and the Federation also at this point is is, is going through its golden era this era of complacency and arrogance that the Q warns Captain Picard of in the episode Q Who is and what happens is you get Federation security teams beaming onto planet with type two hand phasers facing off against battalion sized forces of Cardassian warriors which are a, a ferocious 
army and it's the equivalent of sending the police at this point in to deal with an arm with an army and it sort of becomes a sort of stagnant festering kind of ulcer on the western flank of the federation but it's 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 a very low priority to the federation at this point there's nothing really over there for them to really worry about obviously <clears throat> there's a strong feeling against what Cardassio is doing on Bajor but it can't be that massive a feeling because it goes against the Federation Prime Directive of, of non-interference in other people's business the connection is this the Starfleet since the time of the Kitama Accords being signed um, and the, the Romulans had been in a sort of they'd been away they've been out of they've not been really meddling in the affairs of the, of the Alpha Quadrant and Beta Quadrant at all they've sort of been keeping themselves to themselves at this point for se over 70 years and they say it when they when they first return and uh, it's Mark Mark Alamo, isn't it, that plays that that Romulan Romulan that says it. He goes, he says something along the lines of, um, "We've been distracted, but now we're back," or something like that. Anyway, I'm digressing, but yeah. So Wall Three Five Nine happens, and the Federation needs to rebuild its defences along the Romulan neutral zone it had been shown up as well I'm pretty sure that Captain Picard would have sent an intelligence briefing after he'd spoken to Guinan about the events of um, yesterday's Enterprise that the Klingons were not to be mugged off neither if a war was to break out with the Klingons again it would be devastating and there's a chance that they could win the Romulans were now back on the scene and if a Borg incursion was to happen it was more than likely to come from Beta Quadrant so the Federation need to shore up their defences but in order to do this they need things settled they need to know for instance that the Klingons are still well on side and they're still friends and all that which they do quite successfully the Romulans less so you know, but still they need to reinforce that flank and you can't really do that with this festering type of relationship and this sort of conflict brewing on another flank so this is why you see in later seasons of Star Trek The Next Generation sort of all of a sudden the Federation flagship is out in this part of space a massive galaxy class starship which is it's, it gets mugged off the galaxy class but it's ours as now and again that's a sign that Starfleet are taking this area seriously they're sending more resources that way they're looking at the uh, uh, making peace treaties for these con uh, conflicted zones so this is why we get the demilitarized zone this is why we get the marquee popping up all of a sudden all the kind of side effects that happen from it and it also go a long way to explaining why the federation don't seem to care about what they are doing there's something more important to the federation than placating a few locals in this back of beyond the area of space so they sign a iffy contract shall we say a dodgy deal with the Cardassians but getting closer to the wire of Deep Space Nine so Starfleet have obviously been aware Federation have been aware of a 
militia movement, a terrorist group movement, a bunch of freedom fighters, whichever way you look at it, on Bajor, trying to end what they call the uh, occupation. And it was an occupation. The Cardassians are, again, a resource-poor society, which is hard for me to believe, given the size and the nature of the Milky Way galaxy and the abundance of things, and especially in an era where replicators can be found on every corner. I digress. So, 50, 60 years before the events of Deep Space Nine, they start sending advisors and envoys and diplomats to Bajor. And it's never a full on ground invasion with them to start with. It's more subtle, it's done with more guile in that. It's Cardassian companies buying out the mining rights to this large ore mine on Bajor 4 or it's um, a Cardassian transporter manufacturer is investing heavily in this building site much the way colonisation would happen throughout our history on earth and then with that comes the military aspect of it all of a sudden they've got their own military guards there and then before you know it the Bajoran government is in the complete hands of the Cardassians and then before the the Bajorans know it they are a vassal state of the Cardassians so they start rebelling they start they conduct this terror this terror campaign and it seems to me to be quite quite effective but it also strikes me as a little bit of a coincidence that policy within the Federation shifts and three years later kind of thing to almost to the day the Bajoran militia, the Bajoran resistance have got enough clout to be able to evict the Cardassians from their territory. It's almost like Starfleet and Section 31 or whatever might have been in there tooling them up and helping them out. Because having a place like Bajor where, they, where you could have a small star base or whatever in, uh, to oversee Federation affairs within the region will be very handy and it's the humanitarian thing to do given the atrocities which were being committed on Bajor and from what we know from watching Deep Space Nine and reading the expanded media it was horrific and the Cardassians would commit acts of, acts of barbarism and it's actually not really said in a lot of science fiction actually but one of the true horrors of war and invasions and occupations is is sexual violence and it is, that's something that Deep Space Nine as a television show touches upon and it touches upon the, the ramifications of that and it touches upon what happens to the children of these encounters it, it touches upon the, the PTSD the victims of these encounters and it also shows a nuanced approach to it in that some Bajoran women may have fallen in love with Cardassian men and we see later on it's not um, it's, it's, it's uh, pulling no punches with this one Golden Cot is shown up for having been uh, fallen in love with a Bajoran woman and having, a, having an illegitimate child with this woman and that child then goes on to be a main character of the show for a couple of seasons. So, it's a horrific era for Abbasur in history. But, they finally managed to evict the Cardassians from Bajor. But, it has to be said, Bajor 
again at this stage during federation planning and federation strategic discussions and everything it's just not that important to them they could have quite easily constructed a star base down their open base or whatever kind of thing outside of Cardassian territory it's just easier for them to be there it's the humanitarian thing to do it's the right thing for them to do as well given the, the, the horrors that happened during the during the occupation Bajor was left with nothing the Cardassians robbed the planet of everything of value including priceless religious artifacts these Bajoran orbs which we'll go into later but strategically at this point Bajor is the back of beyond it's, it's, it's utterly meaningless to most, most planning most strategic planning So, Cardassian culture is based around family foremost. They live in large extended families with, with several generations all living in the same house. They live very, very secretive lives. It's a Cardassian tradition that on their deathbed they will hand their secrets down as if they're handing off private heirlooms like it's an incredible concept really um you often see a lot you can tell a lot from a culture from the architecture for instance Cardassian architecture nothing is hidden within it you can see the functionality of it and but it's also at the same time attempts to be very beautiful everything is done in this number three in this multiplication of threes with them you can see it on D Space Nine three rows of three pylons and then three rows of three weapon cells and stuff it's deeply hierarchical it's a very militarized society Again, it's a very poor society, but it's very rich in art and literature. Um, to a human reading Cardassian literature, it's hard going because it's that you know what you know who the killer is from the very beginning of the, of the murder. There's no mystery, and it's all about the same thing: like multiple generations of the same of of, the, of a family coming to the same conclusion that the right thing to do is to serve the state it's ruled by a military high command which are supposed to report to a group of civilians called the, called the, the Tapa Council really low at this pre Deep Space Nine stage power is residing with the military but it is there's a series of checks and balances and one of those balances and the most major one for Cardassians and, and Cardass Cardassian society is a group called the Obsidian Order and they are like um, think KGB type they are a paramilitary organisation they're not supposed to have any of their own starships or anything only small weapons but they are very conniving very devious they, and it they are the best Cardassians in a way because they will they see furthering the interests of the state and the Cardassian race as to be above their own individual self one of the best characters in Star Trek history Elin Garak was a member of the Obsidian Order and you're sort of led to believe that his dad might have been head of the Obsidian Order. But again, it, it, just off topic slightly, it, it, it ties in in this brilliant way Star Trek can tell stories. And different way that Star Trek tells stories. Because you get to have episodes that are about Bashir and Garrett playing James Bond in the holodeck. Okay, that's amazing and funny, funny enough, like, like this sort of Cardassian wearing, wearing a tuxedo.
but at the same time you've got some real sci-fi going on there because everyone, everyone else is trapped in like a transporter beam or something you know, I'm digressing because of the nature of Goddess in society it does leave people impoverished Wayun the Volta remarked that when the, when the Dominion first arrived on Cardassia Prime, children were starving in the streets. That should be anathema. That should just not happen to any race within the Star Trek universe. But it was happening. All right, fair enough. It was happening during the middle of wartime because there was a war going on with the Klingons. But I suspect that even before that, there was a lot of wants. Cardassia and in a way you're led to believe that like like on earth during the medieval period the only way for wealthy young men to progress was to if they couldn't be going go and become a knight which would normally be the oldest son would go off and get their knighthood and earn their money through tournaments the other brothers would go into the clergy they would go and become monks and they'd learn to read and stuff like that. I get the sense that in Cardassian society, if you don't join the military, the central command, you're sort of ushered into the Obsidian Order, or you're ushered into doing other, just more mundane civilian type work. But it's all aimed at promoting the state. I can't even consider making this video without p making a section about Gull Scarron Ducat. He's one of science fiction's best characters, he's one of science fiction's best villains and I am sorry to everybody who adores the Borg Queen or loves the Q or even people that are still enamoured with Khan. But Goldicott is the finest villain in Star Trek history. And he is so because of his motivations. As I've said before, a Cardassian will obliterate their self in service to the state. But he does this with such grace and poise and charisma. He's almost sympathetic as a villain. Later on, he starts to lose his marbles a bit and I don't like this this era of Ducat but he comes back very conniving and very strong during series 7 but Goldicott is he is the what they used to call the prefect of Bajor so he was the the last Cardassian governor of Bajor He's the one that oversaw the evacuation and the pullout. And on day one, episode one of Deep Space Nine, he's there looking round Captain Sisko's office, basically threatening that he's going to have it back at some point or another. But Goldicott has got this air of arrogance about him. He doesn't blame himself for losing on Bajor. He blames the central command for it. Because he always felt that the use of violence was too heavy handed on Bajor. And he's but he's got no he hasn't got the self awareness to realise that any violence meted out against the people of Bajor by his people is utterly and completely morally repugnant. But it's his mission to restore some form of what he considers to be greatness to Cardassia and he weaves his schemes and in some episodes he, he's actually one of the good guys on Deep Space Nine, some episodes he will team up with 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 Cisco and the gang, other episodes he'll act more conniving, other episodes he'll use them, like he'll, he'll turn around and be like oh we just need to go and check out this little prison colony because there might be some Pajorans there and when he gets there, he's going to try and murder one of them. And the one he's going to try and murder, it turns out to be his illegitimate daughter. So he's a very rich character. And he's part of the, the 
the double act that teaches us so much about Cardassian culture, which is the other side is Garak. And I'm not going to dwell actually too much on Garak because he's a spy. And anything you know about him is true, especially the lies. And that's all you can really say about Garak, apart from the fact that he was just, again, like Golden Cop, just absolutely fantastic, well, fantastically well written and fantastically designed. His story art was brilliant. His his one his little quips and one liners were fantastic. There's there's I've spoken about Golden Cop, like Golden Cop and his character and the way he was going to gun down his own daughter. Well. Garak turns around one day and says, they're talking, like him and Bashir are having a chat, and he's going, oh, I wish I'd killed that, 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 the cop when I had a chance, and, um, Bashir's going, like, oh, why, 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 when did you have the chance, and he's like, oh, well, we was fighting loads of Klingons together, in the episode of The Way of the Warrior, and he turned his back to me, and I thought to myself, there and then, I could have killed him, and Bashir turns around and goes, like, at, like outraged, like genuinely outraged. He's like, you'd shoot a man in the back. And Garak turns around to him, and he he sums up Cardassian culture, the nature of Cardassians, his own nature, as well with just the simple sentence. Well, of course, where else would you shoot a man? And when Bashir pushes him a bit further as to why he didn't murder him, he turns around and goes, well, there's too many Klingons and he couldn't have fought them off on his own. That sums up Garak. Garak is just fantastic. A, a gem. Andrew J. Robinson plays him. And his actual real daughter plays um, Zial as well, Tora Zial, in the show. Anyway, I digress. So there's actually a little bit of, of characterization as well going on with Goldie Cor, which is very, very subtle. And it's very, very much matching r- real world dictators, which we have on Earth. Is that gold, the, 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 name, the word Gull is, is, is a rank in the Cardassian military. And there's... I think the, the, high, the highest rank is like Glyn. So he would be like Glyn Ducott. And he doesn't. He, he could easily attain that grade. He could easily get himself promoted by, by having somebody murdered or just acting like a slime ball or releasing someone's secrets just in the way that Cardassians do business. But he doesn't. And what he does, he, he keeps himself at goal level. So if Glyn is like general, Gull is like colonel, and he keeps himself at that colonel kind of grade because he feels it, it keeps him more involved with his own troops and it gives him more flexibility to command and everything. And he likes to think it makes him more of a man of the people, a bit like our own real world Colonel Gaddafi. There's a lot of tension between Goldicott and Garak because he's sort of led to believe that Garak murdered. Well, you're not led to believe, like, you, you, is that right? It's stated Garak executed Goldicott's father. But business is business when you're a Cardassian and you've got the Obsidian Order. So I'll tell you something, one of the places where Deep Space Nine falls down is that the writing of the show really deeply and explores many, many other cultures, more so than, than, than in any other aspect of Star Trek has, has gone before it. You get these, 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 these once, a, once a series, right, you get these Ferengi episodes of it, which are just absolutely at this world brilliant. They, a lot of it is comic relief. But some of them were just genuinely really good episodes. I mean, you, there's, there's an episode where Iggy Pop turns up in it 
think he's, I think he plays that turns up in two episodes. I'm not sure where they have to do something on Empop more and it's, it, it, I won't ruin it for you, but it's full of these. Really, it's really funny. It's called the, Mag- the Magnificent Ferengi. Ferengi it's called. And there's other episodes where they end up going back through time, and it turns out they're they're responsible for the Roswell incident, and things like that. So you explore Ferengi culture in in depth, and the the the, the Ferengi race is really fleshed out well throughout these Space Nine. I, I, I spoke a moment ago about the Cardassian race and their culture and how well that is fleshed out. Klingon culture actually is really, really, really worked on. In throughout, well, definitely from season four onwards when Wolf joins the show. Prior to that, you've got the character of Dax, who's really an expert in Klingon culture. She has some adventures, but really from series four onwards, the, 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 the entire Klingon thing is really well expanded upon. But ironically enough, I actually don't think that Bajoran culture is is touched upon m- much at all. It, it's it's a shame. And you'd think for a, sp- a, a TV show set in a space station like a couple of hours flight from Bajor they'd spend a lot more time down there. But you don't really get to learn much about Bajoran culture. You don't really get you, you, for instance you can't you can't learn what the Bajoran legal code is because they've never done an episode where like one of the characters has been put on trial in Bajor it's sort of like you know it's it's not really done it, in a way that like there's been episodes where where Chief O'Brien was put on trial on Cardassia and you learn a lot about Cardassian culture from that I think Michael Warner's in that episode, episode I'm not sure and you learn a lot about how the, the the Kardashian legal system works. You also learn a lot about um, the rivalry between the Obsidian Order and the Central Command, and, and it's used to sort of set up some storylines in the future. You learn a lot about the Klingon legal system in certain episodes. Well, like, where's the, there's an episode where Wolf's put on trial for blowing up a Klingon transport ship. But it, I'm using that as an example. With Bajoran, the Bajoran culture, you, you're sort of left guessing, and it's sort of left it's left unexplored, and it's a bit lacking in certain certain areas, which is a shame because it does seem like a like a rich seam to tap. That from the from what you do get, you, you kind of have to glean it from religious stuff because that's where all the religion of the show takes place. Because the Bajoran people worship the aliens that live in the wormhole as their prophets, and they worship. They don't. They don't so much worship Captain Cisco, but he's like the the emissary of the prophets. He's their messenger. Messenger. In fact, he's half prophet himself. Um. So yeah, you you don't really get to see much. To be fair, there is a lot of cross pollination between Cardassian design and architecture. And Bajoran, and that is something you'd expect for a planet that had been occupied for that length of time. Mind you, saying that, I'm sort of disagreeing with myself because, like, the British were in were in India for, for well over a century, and yeah, there might be one or two buildings built in the English style, but. It still is very much. If you look at Indian culture and Indian religious stuff, and you look at their buildings and architecture and everything, it's very it's it's, it's, it's Indian. Just instantly by looking at it, you can tell it's Indian. You can't do that with Bajor and stuff, like separate to Cardassian stuff. If you can look at Bajor and you can look at Cardassia, it's the same colour palette they use, and it's it's lost. You know, even things like the subtle things like the the weapons they use and things like that, you can tell they're kind of like possibly outdated versions of Cardassian stuff which they've just picked up and whatever. But still, you, it is a shame, and you sort of they're thinking that oh, I really wish like Major Kira would tell more of her war stories, or 
you'd learn more about Aldo's police job during the, the occupation. I mean, they are they do explore that, and they do explore that quite well in certain episodes, but you're sort of left wanting more from Brazilian culture, especially considering that they are the host for what is about to erupt around them. So let's explain the space station itself, Deep Space Nine, Terraknor. It's a ore refining facility that is in orbit of the planet Bajor. It was built using Bajoran prisoners with jobs, shall we say. Uh, it was built using slave labour. Um, it's again with this with this Cardassian obsession with hierarchy and everything. It was it had been low enough orbit around Bajor, and it's so fucking huge that it would have been seen from the naked eye. This 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 gigantic installation orbiting the planet Bajor, looking down on on it, and it was really tooled up by the standards of the day. I mean, if they, if the, if the Cardassians had really wanted to, they could have just lobbed a few torpedoes out of it down onto the planet and really caused some serious amount of damage. I'm pretty sure they probably did from time to time, and it was like that as a constant reminder to the Bajoran people. Um, there's loads of subtle things going on with that with the station as well. Like when it was originally in orbit of Bajor, if you sat in the prefect's office, which was Captain Cisco's office later on. The dead centre of the window behind him would always have been a star, and that star would have been Cardassia Prime. Loads of soul shit like that was going on with it, but it's a it's a mining station again. It's going back to what I was saying earlier. Nothing of strategic value there. But what happens is Starfleet go in there the day afterwards after. The Cardassians leave, they can't take this place on with them, so they smash the place up a bit. They butcher and murder a load of people and then fuck off. So, Starfleet turn up with the Enterprise D, start doing repairs, start humanitarian operations on the planet. I mean, you'd think there'd be a lot more than one Galaxy class starship. I mean, I know that. It, like I said, the galaxy class isn't no slouch, but you'd think they'd send a lot more resources to Bajor than what they did. But a few days after that, Captain Cisco arrives, and then a few days after that, the rest of the crew arrives. But I think for everybody there that was of Starfleet origin, they were just like, this is a backwater place where I've got no prospect of promotion. Like I, I'm either being pickled here, or I'm here because I want to be here because it's quiet. And you can certainly sense that. Like characters like Chief O'Brien. Chief O'Brien had been through a lot on the Enterprise, and he just started a family. Molly O'Brien was a tiny baby at the time. Keiko was a schoolmistress on 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 the Enterprise, and I think O'Brien had taken the the choice to be operations officer on Deep Space Nine. Because he he knew he could really sink his teeth into the place and like, fix it up, but at the same time it was going to be at the back of beyond. It weren't going to be on the front line. It was going to be in the middle of nowhere, and he could have just got on with his job. Um, Doctor Bashir, I personally think Doctor Bashir, although he gives it the big one about oh yeah frontier medicine and all that kind of stuff, Doctor Bashir knew he needed to go and hide out in somewhere like Deep Space Nine because of his genetically modified nature would have been picked up upon sooner or later if he was serving cheek by jowl with a crew of people on a starship you know so there's that element to it um i think the only person who's sort of there for any reasons apart from either wanting to hide or just wanting to chill out and coast along with their careers was dax now the only reason dax turned up at deep space nine was because cisco asked her and she, I think she, she the fucked off, like giving a little bit of time. Once she knew that Captain Cisco was okay in the head, like, like he done his, that his grieving process was done, and he was happy and settled. Um, 
Yeah, that is just Captain Cisco. I think he was only there as well. He only took the post in, again because it was an easy, out of the way one, and he had a son that he was raising on his own. And he wasn't bored at Utopia Planitia at Fleet Yards, but you know, the job had to go to someone else. So yeah, they was expecting it to be this like arse end of the universe place when they got there. But during the first episode of Star Trek: The Deep Space Nine. MS3, everything changes because they find the wormhole and what the wormhole is is if you're not a fan of science fiction it's just basically a way of moving across the, uh, an area of space which would take you hundreds of years to, tra to, to traverse normally in conventional sense but it's just basically like a shortcut, it's a tunnel like that, that, that takes you from a, a, to, a to B much quicker, and it's the only stable wormhole known to be in existence, and it just opens up Bajor from being the backwater of nowhere where it, where, where it actually is to actually being a destination in its own right, to being a place of importance uh, to events, and it enables, it gives Cisco a reason to be because it, he's got this entire new quadrant of the galaxy he can go and explore. Yeah, that's, you know what I mean? But that's basically it. And it changes the whole strategic situation because the Cardassians want it to start with and they could have taken it and all. So what they do is they manage to use a combination of Star Trek legendary trickery and guile and plot armour and whatnot to make the space station so light that even with its own existing few thrusters that it's got working at that point they can traverse the distance in a matter of hours which would have taken them months to a position just outside the mouth of this wormhole and What's going on at this point is Captain Sisko's inside the wormhole and he's negotiating with the wormhole aliens or prophets, whichever you want to call them, the sort of the, the whether, whether or not civilizations and species like ours that live on our plane of existence are allowed to travel through it. And ultimately, he said they, they say yes. So, this is a gift for everybody, but it's a gift especially for Bajor because. When people pass through the wormhole, they want to stop off. The first place they're going to stop off is going to be Deep Space Nine, and the second place they're going to stop off is Bajor. So all of that trade, all of those new races and species and all that, are at the other side of this wormhole. It's it's the equivalent of opening up the Suez Canal, or the Panama Canal, or something like that. It's, it's, it's that it is that economically important to Bajor, and strategically important, but or I've just said this about its strategic importance. Starfleet, for the first three whole series, don't take it seriously. They send starships through, but they send like the USS Proxima through. And Proxim the USS Proxima was uh, an ancient constitution, what was it? A Federation class ship which is basically a constitution with an extra in a cell through to go and explore they tool up the space nine a little bit but they only give them three runabouts to start with for to defend the station to defend themselves and everything which is a tiny amount although runabouts are are tough little ships they really are they, they get mugged off a little bit because there's a high rate of attrition with them but honestly they ain't that bad their starfleet is still really got one eye on the Borg and the Borg threat they're terrified about it because of what happened at Wall 359 so they are, they're really slow to get on the uptake with these West Island and to register its importance to them I mean, there's complete episodes where they're, they're sort of willing to abandon the place, really, to the, to the Bajoran government. The, Bajoran, the, the Bajorans are basically having a bit of a coup going on, and non-Bajorans ain't welcome on the planet, and like, the Federation are just willing to just get up and go kind of thing and leave the place after all the investment they've made. But um, 
as the time progresses, the importance of the wormhole becomes more and more apparent, and the importance of Deep Space Night itself becomes more and more apparent. So, at the end of series two, you see the advent of the Dominion coming into it. And you see the Gem Hadar, and these are a ferocious race of beings from the other side of the Milky Way. They are the anti Federation. And what Starfleet do is they assign, they send the USS, USS Odyssey through, which is a galaxy class, which as a viewer is deliberately chosen because it's the hero ship of Next Generation. You don't expect to see a galaxy class blown up. But from an in universe perspective, you don't expect to see a galaxy class blown up. And that's exactly what happens. They're about to retreat, and the Dominion's kamikaze in the, in the deflector dish blow the entire ship up. So, the Federation finally start listening, and what they do is they, they send the Defiant out to be docked permanently in Deep Space Nine and, and to provide an extra layer of defence and offence as well. Which is, is quite an effective little ship at what it does. I will do a video about the Defiant, in I'll do a deep dive on, on the Defiant actually. And then a year later, you're finally starting to see them upgrade the defences on Deep Space Nine to the point where it is sort of with ease at this point able to see off like a full on Klingon attack. So that is Deep Space Nine. The why of Deep Space Nine explained why it all happened there, sort of thing. What Starfleet was doing on Bajor, why there was conflict between the Cardassians and the Federation. It's hopefully all made clear as much for you in this video. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Give me a like and give me give me a subscribe if you've made it this far. Because I know my I know my audience retention rate is not that good. Um, but if you have made it this far, I'm very grateful to you. And please like and please subscribe and please comment because it really helps me if the YouTube algorithm and it helps me grow the channel. And I want to grow this channel because I want to make these videos because I enjoy talking about science fiction. I enjoy these, these kind of deep dives, sort of like in universe, like really, really going into the minutiae of it and really geeking out. I love doing this sort of thing. But at the same time, I love doing videos like I've done the other week about children of men so yeah thank you for watching my video